Welcome to this lady. Thank you. I think, <laughs> and I know that I'm going to get in trouble because this is probably like a really like kind of like garbagey American thing to say. Can you just clearly state your name once? <laughs> Lena Dunham. <laughs> Otessa Moshfeg. So good. But I was so afraid to say it <laughs> and fuck it up and not seem like the fan that I truly am. Well, you did the right thing. Thank you so asking. much. But I didn't know if later you were going to be like, she asked me to pronounce my name, this fucking <laughs> bitch. <laughs> I will say that. Um, Repeatedly. <laughs> Just kidding. It's such an honor to be here with you. Your writing you. has meant so much to me. And it's truly, I think, um, it's a testament to, your, to the nerve that you have hit all of the people who are here in this, uh, in this temple with us. Thank you. That's so, awesome. Thank you all. Um, so this is the second to last stop on your tour. You've been rocking this out for a little bit. Yeah. Second to last night. Amazing. Have you uh, so much, I was thinking about this because so much of this book is about wanting to retreat from people and humanity and like shutting people off in the most aggressive way possible, which is to hibernate. Uh -huh. um, so what does it feel like to you to be exposed to people so intensely? I know it's been a complex one for me. Uh -huh. So I'd love your thoughts on that and uh, some help if you could give it to me. <laughs> um, well, I, I have this weird ability to forget things. And like, if you asked me where I've been on this tour, I could, I could tell you the cities, but I can't remember anything about it. So I, let, I kind of let things go. I'm not big on memories. <laughs> that, that, that helps with resentments. That's so nice. So if you just give up on wanting to remember things, <laughs> then you can feel safer in your life. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> You'll be okay. Done and done. And have you felt, what have the reactions been like? Because there's always, when you put something out into the world, a piece of art, there's the reactions that exist in the public. And it's sort of this like, it's sort of like, I don't know if anyone remembers that 1950s movie about the blob that just keeps rolling around and grabbing teenagers and grabbing houses and grabbing food and getting bigger and bigger. Like, that's the public reaction. But then there's like the people who come up to you and are like, this book meant X to me. And sometimes you're really thrilled. And sometimes there's wild misinterpretations that make you feel like you've done something terrible. Mm. So what have been the most meaningful reactions to you? What has felt good? What has felt scary? Um, what's been, I'll start from the end. The, I think the scariest was when a woman in the audience, here's a memory, a woman in the <laughs> audience in Dallas asked me how I conducted my research to make sure that the combinations of medications my character took were going to be okay. That was terrifying. <laughs> So basically what she was saying was like, I don't want to talk to my doctor about my destructive drug taking yes. behavior. Yes. Can you let me know that this combination of Lunesta and propofol won't kill me? Right. So yes. stressful. It was, it was really weird. And, and the bookseller was like, Linda, no. <laughs> Shh. So basically Linda's just like the town pill head. I think just she like might be. Horrible. If anyone here knows Linda, she needs you. She might need help. She's so, all on her own. Yeah, <laughs> so that was the worst. No, that was the scariest. Yeah. That was the scariest. <laughs> but it was also hilarious. Yeah, um, it's so special. I mean, a lot of people have, have come up and, and told me how much the book meant to them. And I think what I appreciate the most is when somebody's actually finished the book so that they can say how the book left them feeling. and. Uh, the people who have been like, this was life affirming. I'm like, well, I'm so glad it was that yeah. rather than the opposite. And the people who are 30 pages in say this is life affirming. You're like, just you wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, I took some notes inside of my signed copy. Don't want to brag, but I think you could get one too tonight. Um, the first note I took is this book is wild, truly wild. This cover is pink, but for me, it's a Ray Bradbury story. Hmm. Tell me about the genesis of the cover. No of the story. That, oh. was a, that was a badly formed question. Okay. Um, well, the genesis of the story, I think, and it's m most essentially, I'm like, always tired. Like, always. Really, really tired. I don't sleep enough, <clears throat> unlike my character. So I think 
essentially this is a, a projection of my own fantasy to sleep for a year. That sounds really nice. Um, but I started sketching out the character when I, I was staying with a friend on the Upper East Side and sort of observing that culture and looking at people who I, f I felt initially like, oh, I have nothing in common with these people. Like, nothing in common in terms of my background, what I look like, what my taste is. And, and, and I realized that I was discounting them. I was discounting their consciousness. So they started like, well, what, would it, what, what might they be thinking? And so I started sketching this character. And of course, she wasn't going to be normal. So I wrote about her like habitual behavior, and then the premise of the sleep came about. And then in writing her interpretation of, of culture in Manhattan and the art scene in particular, I realized that what she was describing was a pre-9-11 New York. And that's when it clicked into place that I was in the year 2000. And then the plot developed. And when you say you were like discounting her in her life, like I have a real problem with doing that with blondes. Mm -hmm. It's like, I sometimes look at them and I'm like, what fun, what joyful fun. Like I understand, and you talk about this here, I understand I have a lot of friends who are blonde. Some of them have had really hard lives. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated. <laughs> the woman who introduced us, beautiful blonde, owns the Strand, clearly a working mind, but it's just <laughs> like, it's hard for me. It's hard for me sometimes to believe that skinny women have problems. Like I have a lot of shit like that that I am working on, but I wonder, <laughs> I'm working on it, but I wonder for you when you say like you were just counting their inner lives, what did it mean to try to like peek into the noggin of someone who didn't like share, who, who walked through the world in such a different way than you do? Well, I think I just projected myself into a different entity. I mean, I don't know how else to do it. I'm not yeah. s that psychic. But, um, well, you know, it's more than blonde. I think the thing is, like, I, I, de I decided to make this character really stereotypically beautiful. Like, nobody could argue with her. Like, she, was, she knew she was beautiful, and she was beautiful. She was tall, thin, blonde, and, like, interesting enough to work in an art gallery. So she was cool. Yeah. And... I thought about the experience of what it must be like to be that attractive and how different you get treated. Like each time you walk into a room, like people must respond to you differently. And then to have life go wrong must feel so much more disappointing. Like, because you're like, I was set up for total success yes. and I managed to fuck this up. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, th I think. I think we all have a kind of version of that. Like we think the world is one way and then shit happens and we're like, oh fuck, yeah. now what? I think about this all the time. I just, mm. I came directly from therapy on 13th and 8th, there three times a week if you're looking for me. <laughs> and to hear, and literally while I was there, I was like, I was just watching an E! True Hollywood story the other day and thinking like, this woman is a stupid. And then I was like, I'm stupid. Wait, the, the person on TV was Yeah, stupid? I was like, oh, all this stuff that ha that's happened to her. Like, what gullible idiot would find themselves in, oh, God. Like, I just, like, <laughs> and that's a big one. Thank you so much. I love you so much. I feel blessed that you're here. Another thing that I find to be so, well, it's funny you say the thing about the fantasy about sleeping for a year, because a bit, one time, one time this very, pervy creep was writing me like a series of emails in my early 20s and in one of them <laughs> he's famous guys and uh but i'm not going to name him because i'm waiting to get paid a lot of money <laughs> but uh but um he was like, what is, your, what is your biggest fantasy? And I literally tried to summon it and I said, it's to sleep for 24 hours then have someone wake me up and say, you can't go back to sleep till you finish this bowl of pasta and then to go back to sleep. <laughs> was like, that your sexual fantasy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's no yeah. sex in it. <laughs> yeah. But it is kind of erotic. Yeah. There's like, that like S&M element with the pasta. A hundred percent. And then that sleep, and then that like carbo loaded sleep element. Yeah. So that was all Sounds in here. Good. I was thinking, I mean, I spent my whole 20s just working and sleeping, often aided by 
pharmaceuticals I had collected in my purse. And I worked and slept through so much and, and I always kind of I always kind of thought like like fiction about addiction had this sort of I'm really I love addiction memoirs. They're like a true passion <laughs> of mine. But there's something about fiction about it where I'm like talk about something real. Like, don't talk about what medicine does. Talk about life. And then I read this and I was like, oh, you've somehow managed to find the place where, like, pills become a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Pills and medication become a metaphor for, like, what life actually does to people and what life actually does to women. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if that, res like a college student, I'm like, I wonder if that resonates for you. But also I wonder, like, what role you thought the medication was playing in this book and also like how you made that active because you managed mm -hmm. to make the app like people in Hollywood are always like you can't write about writers it's boring to watch people write you know what's really boring is to watch people sleep yeah and you made it feel really alive All right someone asked me the other day why I had to write the book in past tense and I thought about it I was like that's a good question and then I was like well it is, it's it a good question that sounds like a bad question and then you think about it and but it's then a I good thought about it and then I realized well if it had been set in present tense there there would be no book because she sleeps. Yeah. She's asleep. It would be like, okay, I'm going to sleep now. <laughs> like, blank pages, like 20 blank pages. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I'm up. Yeah. Right. But wait, you what, wait. You just asked me something. Well, I, I was sort of remember. like, for me, the whole thing of the medication and oh, the right. combos of the medication and the psychiatrist who gives her the medication. It's actually like a like when you said she's this really beautiful woman and life doesn't go for her the way she thought it would all of the pills and the combinations of the pills and the doctor administering the pills, like that almost feels to me like a metaphor for all of the shit that gets thrown at women and people as they walk through the world. Mm. That's how I read it. I don't know if I can speak directly to that reading. No need. But what I can say is that I never thought about this book as an addiction book or a book about an addict. I thought about it as somebody undertaking a delusional creative and spiritual project using drugs slash prescription. Okay, prescriptions are drugs, so I don't know, drugs yeah. to get there. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't think that, and, 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 and your question is really good. Like, how did I get the, like a book about sleep to be an active story. And it's like I had to figure out, I had to come up with some sort of device for her sleep to get fucked up. And that device early on are, is her relationship with Riva. And then it- Who's her best friend who she's sort of wildly emotionally abusive to in a certain yeah. way. But then Riva also like, she needs to Reva's asking for it at the same time. They're yeah. very codependent. I was going to say, she needs to get herself to an Al-Anon meeting, uh, Reva. Yeah, I, well. Um, Talk to me after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Reva would be so annoying in Al-Anon. Oh, my God. Her, I would sh not. her shares just... would be a roughie. And then the way that she would act afterwards, she'd be like, well, she would just... Well, she's somebody who's constantly seeking how to better herself in the most pathetic ways. And yeah, I think totally. that, that kind of personality that latches on to systems she of recovery She for sure reads psychology so today. Annoying. She reads psychology today at the airport like a jerk. Probably. <laughs> Maybe. Wait, is that a bad magazine? It's not. It's kind of good, but it's sort of like you kind of read. I think every time I've read psychology today, it's because I'm like, I don't have time for therapy. My life is so busy, but I'm going to pick up this issue of psychology today. This will solve all my problems. Yeah, it's psychotic. Um, so for, at first, it's her relationship with Reva, oh, her right. very codependent then, best friend. Yeah, thank you for keeping this on track. I guess that's why you're here. Um, the, and, and then this medication she gets prescribed, not even prescribed, handed to her it's, that, that is fictional, which creates this break in her consciousness where she's now, I don't want to give too much of the book away, but like now she's doing stuff in her, in an unconscious state that is impacting her real conscious life in a way that is conspiring to help her in some ways and then also forcing her to look at a lot of sh shit that she wishes that she could hide from in sleep. So it's sort of a double-edged sword. Well, so I was actually thinking about this take because I was, I, 
went back to sleep this morning and was having some like really active rage dreams. And like when I have those, I get so mad because I'm like, that was my time. How dare you invade my time? Oh, you like know? you like I was supposed to be like sleeping. I was just having, having like, a peaceful break okay. from screaming at this person. Oh, and yet here I find myself. And there's a lot of that in this book, like real life starts to worm its way. Yeah. Do you have a lot of recurring dreams or like recurring themes in your dreams? Yeah. Do like, you? Um, yeah. Almost every dream I have is like it's like, well, it's the apocalypse again. <laughs> um, and you're about to miss the last train. So, oh, no. There's a train in the apocalypse? <laughs> yes. Well, there needs to be some way out. And I'm like, but your bird got out of its... Ch you can't leave without your parakeet. You <laughs> do you have an IRL parakeet? You don't know. No, but I've had a lot of birds in my life. That's yeah. You can't leave without your parakeet. A big one for me that's been going on all this year, bless you, is a big one for me has been that I'm, I find out that I actually didn't finish college. So I have to move back to Ohio at the same time that I'm running my business and trying to like, like as a 32 year old woman, I have to move back to the small town in Ohio where I went to college, but I can't live in the dorm cause I'm too old. And so in order <laughs> to find a, in order to find a place to live, I have to go to a very specific used bookstore when a certain man is there and be like, may I stay in your apartment? Someone told you I can stay in your apartment. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. Wow. But I'm sick of it. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> so stupid. Something, speaking of her relationship with Reva, something I really love and connect to about this book is like the main character is radically selfish. Like her selfishness uh -huh. is almost like a political act. Like she's just like, oh, you want something from me? Well, mm -hmm. it's a no. Mm -hmm. And people I know from my own work and my own life, people have a pretty bad reaction to selfish women. Like it's not... It's not a comfortable space. There's a way, it's something that we expect from male protagonists, which is that they're gonna like move through the world, you know, conquering all. And mm -hmm. something we expect from female protagonists is that they're gonna like nurture and care. Mm -hmm. And there's, an, and especially when female, uh, selfish women don't like get their comeuppance, mm -hmm. people, sometimes even women are like pissed. Mm -hmm. And I know you also, you've talked publicly about how kind of surprised you were by how in your first novel, Eileen, how revolted people were by like having um, a female character who was so kind of naughty and fucked up. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, A, what kind of reactions you've gotten to that and what it makes you feel? Because I know it makes me angry. Wait, what makes you angry? When people are like, everything. <laughs> no, when people, um, when people are so sort of, uh, critical of women in fiction making selfish choices, aggressive choices, living imperfectly, having imperfect bodies, uh -huh. all of that. Well, I feel like I feel like I kind of nailed it by making her beautiful because nobody has come up to me and be like this is a really terrible character. Like I think it, the, the, like everybody had permission to be revolted by Eileen because she wasn't beautiful. But this is like, this is a different story. You, you would watch, I don't know, who's like a really beautiful woman? Me. Okay. <laughs> like, we would watch you do really bad shit. And we wouldn't go around being like, she's, I don't like her personality. We'd be like, she's this fascinating. This metaphor fell apart. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's change it to supermodel Carly Kloss. Okay. Right. Okay, Carly Kloss. I mean, if, if Carly if Carly Kloss was chugging a coffee in an elevator, you wouldn't be like, she's really hitting that coffee hard. <laughs> You'd be like, that's badass. Yeah, right? you would. Yeah. So that that's how superficial we are. Yeah. And that's how superficial I expected readers to be. And I was right because <laughs> people aren't coming up to me to be like, this is a terrible character the way that they were about Eileen. When really this protagonist is so much more selfish oh and so much more perverse in her delusions. So yeah. really, really what? Everyone's a, everybody sucks. So Everybody's just a big doofus. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating to me because I read it and I was like, this person is the kind of friend who you would walk away from after 15 seconds if, it's true, like if they were not, if they didn't have like an aura right. yeah, yeah, yeah. and glamour, yeah, yeah. you'd be like, 
this girl's psychotic. Yeah, I don't want to deal with this. And I don't yeah. want to deal with this. I think therapists are so goofy to write. It's so hard to write intelligently because therapy is such a kind of odd, stilted process and you learn so little about the other person in a certain way and so much of it is projection. But I thought you wrote one of like the great psychiatrist characters. And so Thank I wonder you. how you approached that and thought about that. You know, I was talking to my mom the other day and she was like, Oh, and this is how it came up. I, I, I was in my hometown giving a reading. Or no, somewhere else. I can't remember, see? I was giving a reading somewhere. And this woman in the, in the audience asked me, do you think your therapist forgives you <laughs> for writing Dr. Tuttle? Love Dr. Tuttle. And I was like, I don't have a therapist. But if I did, why would I need them to forgive me? And then I was like, are you a psychiatrist? And she was like, I'm a psychologist. <laughs> so I guess she was, I was like, well, I didn't mean to offend you, honestly. She was like, I'm not offended. <laughs> um, I can't remember That's where this was amazing. supposed to go. But, um, oh, so my mom was saying that um, she thinks that therapists must must feel like life is really unfair because it's such an unbalanced human interaction to just sit there and absorb somebody else's shit for like an hour. I can't do that. I mean, I don't like, I don't, I don't know. It, it seems very weird. Like there must be something wrong with these people <laughs> who can just like sit there and absorb crazy. I don't know. How but, many therapists do we have in the audience? Anyone want to put a hand? No therapists? Oh, hooray. Oh, you, well, you look like, I, you don't count. No. You're obviously awesome. You're the best. I would go to you. Yeah, I'm frankly surprised. We're like near the West Village. I thought there'd be like f at least 14. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I drank all, the, can we, is there oh. another water? Oh yeah. my God, thank you. I drank, oh my God, I drank hers and mine okay. and everyone's. Um, well, so you talked about the fact that you said it in the year 2000. Yeah. And I feel like 9-11 plays a kind of unexpected role. And this is also an interesting time in history to be writing about terrorism. And I wondered mm -hmm. what, how you thought about it, both as a plot device and about writing about this issue now. Well, as a plot device, I realized that the only way to handle this Narr narrative, which starts in the year 2000 and ends at some point after 2001, <clears throat> was by using a very, very light touch. N obviously, the narrator doesn't know 9-11 is imminent, but just by setting it in the year 2000, there is a sort of like pregnant in despair and intensity about what's about to happen. The yeah. reader knows. Yep. And... Um, there are two characters that work in the World Trade Center. Yep. And just by just saying uh, Twin Tower, I mean, so much is, is evoked. There's so much that's associated with those words. So I really just had to be like, very delicate about it and understand that touching it just really lightly was going to do a lot. And, 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 but, you know, I didn't feel like... Thank you things. so much. I didn't feel like I was writing about a terrorist attack. I felt like I was writing about <clears throat> loss and, and about the fact that there was sort of one city before and another city after. Yeah. Yeah. Like when the you said definitely you were changed. writing about, when you said that when you were thinking about the culture on the Upper East Side and you realized you were writing about a pre 9-11 New York, there's like a, there's like, there was like a, a different new, I mean, I was in high school at that time here in New York and there was a very different like, New York can be anything mm -hmm. attitude versus yeah. New York is sort of like a, New York is, is sort of like a, as, as a graveyard, it's a different thing. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I, I mean, I've never actually thought about it like that, but um, I felt like I was in college in 2001 and my sense of New York before 9-11 was that it was really, it was still, like, it, it could still afford to be gritty and dangerous because there was enough excess and, and sense of okayness amongst most people. 
and that we were living in a culture where like we had room for absurdity and after 9-11 it was like no like you can't be weird anymore like this yeah. is serious like yeah like come on you guys firefighters and it was just like this this like new code for seriousness yeah and I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how better we could have processed 9-11. I don't know how you're supposed to process something like that. But it changed the city. I mean, I don't need to tell you. I and mean, it's really weird talking to people in New York about it. I'm like, you guys know better than I do. Have you gotten a lot of questions about it? Yeah, people want to know why I said, said it. And people who haven't read the book. Like, I do a reading from the beginning of the book where I'm like, it's the year 2000. And people are like, well, why did you set it in the year 2000? So I have to give an answer yeah. without trying to say too much. And it's also one of those topics. So it's actually like 15 topics like this in this book where it's like to broach them is like vaguely terrifying. And that's something that is really appealing to me about your writing is like you're not afraid. You're not doing the dance, especially because I like so much of my life exists in this other world, which is like the world of film and television where literally like life is just a hot stove, you know? And what do you mean? Just like everything you reach out and, you, and you're like, ow, 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 ow. It's hard to touch topics without getting it wrong or without an immediate internet reaction okay. or immediate rage reaction. And I feel like something that's so appealing to me about your writing and it's an, also a reason that I love Eileen and your short fiction is like the lack of fear about touching things that are dangerous. I don't know if you, do you think when you're writing about how people react, do you think about how people will respond? I, not, not, I don't really think politically in that way. I think what I'm doing to the reader through this virtual reality experience of having language go through their head, you know? Like I think about the visceral response the intellectual response, the emotional response. But I don't think about it in that like big picture, social media, whatever way. I can't, or else, I, I mean, I think that's maybe why a lot of art is getting like boring, is because everybody's afraid to say what they think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid to say what I think. Back to you right now. <laughs> But I agree with you. What, it, what? Well, no, I was just saying, by the way, she has, you guys aren't experiencing it. She has a, we are meeting for the first time. This woman has a very intense gaze and it is <laughs> drawing a lot out of me. It is appealing. It is, I want to go into it while also not giving too much away too quickly. This is a weird place to practice boundaries because yeah. there's so many people watching, but okay, you don't have to answer my question. No, I want to answer your oh, question. Okay. I was just saying that I've, I, what you just said about art getting watered down because so many people are afraid to say what they think. Like one of the reasons I think that this book is touching a nerve and that every single person I know has texted me, have you read this book? Or if they know that I'm interviewing you wants to know what I'm gonna say and what you're like and what it's gonna be like is because there's a sense that you kind of don't give a fuck, which is like a really appealing, like lost art. That's what's <laughs> really, it's really exciting to me to be around and to read. You know, I get my feelings hurt, but it doesn't change what I do. Like I can get That's my feelings hurt in, from like really silly, stupid things. What's the last uh, thing that hurt your feelings? Um, I looked myself up on Twitter today, which I really shouldn't do. And yeah. someone said, how about a pro an 8,000 word profile of how boring and stupid Otessa Moshfeg is? More like Otessa Mefeg. Yeah. <laughs> no! <laughs> and I was, like, I, how, I was like, how rude. It is rude. <laughs> it is rude. I once had an experience where a friend was like, you, they couldn't be as bad as you think on Twitter. Search your name. And I kind of like was like a little tempted by it and I did. And I think we went back like two weeks and we found one person go, I don't think she's as bad as everybody else says. But besides that, it was just like, it was a fucking graveyard. And I, I was just like, imagine. but it's also the thing that you said about you get your feelings hurt, but it doesn't change what you do. Like that's, that's one of the realest things I've heard in a long time. Cause 
if you did change what you do, they would just be mad about the other thing that you did. Yeah, I mean, people, people on the internet, whatever, who cares? I mean, they're just people who, they're, they're people who are tweeting, tweeting. <laughs> Somehow that's you what they're doing the, with their life. Sometimes you, somehow you making the second T and tweet a hard T really yes. brought home how stupid it is. <laughs> it is so that silly. was a really cool language trick. Well, I, I loved it. My mom has a really good language trick. She's from Croatia. She speaks beautiful, fluent English, but she still calls it my iPod. <laughs> 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 About my phone. That's it's still an iPod. I don't know how that's that so happened. That's so good, because an iPod wasn't even called an iPod. No. E, Much less a e-pod. phone. <laughs> Love it. Something that I really appreciate you and I hope about you, and I hope you don't mind me saying this on stage. I thought about sending you the questions, and I was like, nah, she's cool, mm-hmm. is, um, is something I've really liked, because I've also read the... I did read an 8,000 word profile of how not boring you are. My, mm-hmm. my our mutual bud, well, she's my friend and your profiler, R-E-L-E-V. She's a bud, yeah. She's a, she's a true bud. And um, something that I was really impressed with is like, and I've been impressed with this with you in interviews before, is like women are incredibly afraid to say that they think that they're good at things. Mm. And you've been comfortable saying that you feel like you're a good writer and it's, something that you know how to do. Mm -hmm. And I wonder like, where did that, I'm afraid to say I'm good at things I know I'm good at. Where did that come from? Was it about the way that you were raised? Is it about the way that you moved through the world? Did you make a conscious choice to be like, no, no, I'm gonna be honest about this? All of those things, all of those things. I think, I've been talking about my mom a lot. Maybe it's like the therapy thing. Yeah, we're also in very therapy chairs. It's like they made a tiny little therapist's office on a stage. (laughs) That's true. Wait, who's the therapist? I think it's you. Are you sure? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think I'm like the the narcissistic therapist that talks a lot about herself. No, you're some therapists like to disclose. Right. I appreciate that. It can be comforting. Yeah, Not I like that I would too. know, but yeah. I recently said to my therapist, who I've been seeing for almost 20 years, more than 20 years. Wow. One therapist. And it's intense. And I said to her, you seem like you don't ever have a problem knowing when to stop eating. And she was like, mm-hmm. Like, she mm-hmm. just was like, there was not even a... There was not even a language in which to respond to such an insane projection right. upon another woman. That uh-huh. she seemed like she knew when to stop eating. Uh-huh. But I think you seem like you know when to stop eating. Oh, I, I have forced myself, I, like, uh, I have like forced a um, response that's like, I've eaten enough. There were, I, I, most natural functions for me have been like, Something I had to learn. Like, it, nothing really it. came naturally. I really get it. And this but, is a safe space to say that. It is. It's, we're all friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you are you're t- been talking about your mom a lot, but you're back to your mom. Yeah. Oh, you asked me why I feel comfortable being confident. Yeah. Um, my mother sort of brainwashed me. For, uh, she, every day, and I don't know what this was necessarily in, in response to, maybe she had had the opposite upbringing, but she told me every day that I was exceptional and that I could do anything, like every single okay. day. Um, I mean, there was other things that she said, but I got that messaging really early on that I was exceptional and that I could do anything. And then when I discovered that I was a writer, it was like m- my ego about it seemed to just be like, I'm going to go over here and like deal with other stuff. But the writing is, is a sacred space. And if you question it, you're just going to fuck it up. So just get really interested in it. Just work really, really hard. Don't worry if you're not good enough. Like, what is that going to do? Like, if you're really interested in your project, what is it like? What are you getting out of worrying if you're not good enough? You're good enough, just do it. If you're doing it, fine. I mean, I think what I, what I worry about is like, am I, am I, like for this book that I'm about to write, I'm like, am I going deep enough? That, those are the kind of, kinds of like the self doubt that I have. Like, am I taking this far enough? Do I, un, am I being like 
really clear with myself about what I want? Yeah. It's, it, those are the questions. But like, I know that I, I know that I know how to write, and I'm not. It's not cute to be self-effacing. It just isn't. I just don't. I don't find that attractive in other people. And when I have to, when I, my own insecurities are re like really disgust me. So why would I go around parading around in all of my insecurities? That's really um, getting me right where I live. Oh. <laughs> in a good way. But you seem so self-assured. That's bananas. I mean, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to practice something that you would teach me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. That means a lot. Something that is in this book that's really interesting to me is there's a lot of stuff. Your character works in art gallery. There's a lot of stuff about the sale and commercial aspect of making art. At the point you did this, you had written Eileen, you had sold it, there'd been a lot of energy, you'd sold it, it had become, you know, you'd sold the rights to make a movie. Where did your own experience, like, lead you in terms of thinking about art being something that people can live on and not live on and not just live on but make money on and turn into sort of like a crazy success narrative? Well, when I was writing Eileen, I was doing self-hypnosis every night and doing this thing called, actually, I'm not going to tell you what I was doing, but I was like brainwashing myself into the idea that it was possible to make a living as an artist. Were you doing Landmark Forum? No. Okay. <laughs> it's nothing anyone here would have ever heard of. Um, wow, cool. <laughs> But, and it didn't really, it doesn't really matter what it was. The truth is like, I, I was like, okay, I accept that reality is a projection of my subconscious. So the work that I, re I really have to do in life is getting myself to believe. So faith became like the principal element in any kind of success, whether it was like success, oh, I'm going to sell this book and it's going to do well, blah, blah, blah. Or like success, I'm going to... Mm, realize and manifest a vision like that any kind of success like I'm going to recover from this flu you know like whatever it is like I need to believe and 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 start and operating as though I, it has already happened yeah I mean this is like the, the secret it's like I was about to say it's the secret but you're just <sighs> making it sound a lot cooler I mean it, but it, but I think it's so much of it is true because you make so many micro decisions in your subconscious. And if your, sub if your subconscious is like, this is pointless, why am I doing this? Nobody cares, it's gonna fail, I'm gonna be a failure, I'll have to move back in with my mom, blah, 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 blah. All of those micro decisions you make are going to be micro decisions that are going to sabotage you. Yeah. But if you believe that you are going to do something great, then your micro decisions are going to be on the path to doing that. So I just like, Pro, like did some reprogramming because I did Let's, not want to have to like live off of cans of tuna my whole life. No, oh, tuna's disgusting. Actually, I've grown to like tuna. Um, like a fresh tuna or a canned no, tuna? No, like a good can of tuna. Oh, Jesus Christ. There was a time where I hated tuna, but I'm just saying, just wait. Okay. <laughs> You're like five years older than me. I could get there. You got, yeah. Right now, I literally have to leave the room while people are eating it. <laughs> no, don't, no. If somebody else is eating tuna, leave the room. But if you're eating it, it's okay. When it's I like was a farting. kid, my father, who's here, my poor father, he, if he ever ate tuna or eggs, I would line up the salt and pepper shakers in front of him so that I had created a wall to block it from me visually. I, I get that. Just, but, I won't eat tuna around you, I'm just saying. <laughs> when I'm home alone, <laughs> then it's something you might do. I get yeah, it, yeah. I get it. I really get it. Um, it's time for me to ask you some audience questions. Okay, awesome. You should know, we got these on cards, but Otessa made the decision, along with me, we made the decision together, that she would be surprised by the question. So she has not seen these before. I'm like a magician's assistant. She has not seen these before. <laughs> She does not know what she is being asked. Whatever comes out of her mouth is completely natural. Oh, this is a good one. Otessa. Yes. What's the most sexist interview question you remember getting? I'm going to extend that to it can also be misogynistic, racist, or ageist. Oh, okay. That's handy. 
Um, so well, someone one a- once asked me what it's like to be a Muslim American author. You're not a Muslim American author, are you? No. I didn't I'm think not. so. I didn't think so. And also, what kind of question is that? What, what is it like to be a Muslim American author? I know. Oh, it's great. I yeah. really enjoy it. <laughs> like, I once asked a guy at a party if it was fun to be tall. Well, you were just flirting. Yep. Didn't work. No. Oh. Um, he probably just didn't get it. No. <laughs> He's probably not smart he enough. Okay. <laughs> No one's smart enough for the two of us. We're literally gonna turn into like one of those like pair, like after this, we're gonna like go off together and like murder people. <laughs> We've gotten so in each other's heads on stage. We'll talk. <laughs> Otessa, yeah. do you hold the same attitudes towards art as the narrator of my year of rest and relaxation? Can art provide enlightenment? Is enlightenment useless? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I think I do share I do share a lot of my protagonists feelings and attitudes towards art. But unlike my protagonist, I am an artist. So, I really respect art in a way that I don't think that she has the balls to sometimes. I mean, there's another argument to make. I mean, she could be she could be like a more evolved artist than I am, but <clears throat> the second part of the question about enlightenment. Enlightenment has become a really meaningless word. I mean, who do you know who has an enlightening experience and then stays enlightened? Nobody. We all go back to the same neurotic bullshit by the time that experience of enlightenment is over. I mean, I'm not to say, I believe people can grow and change, and I think art is a really powerful tool. Um, and I think art is a really healing, a, like a, something that humans do for healing, and that's important. But I, don't, I think the word enlightenment doesn't really mean anything to me anymore. Yeah, it's a little bit of a, um, you can like buy books about it at Starbucks. That's true. I mean, I love Starbucks. It's my favorite restaurant, but you don't want to like <laughs> get into a whole, you don't want to like get your spiritual program. I mean, it's sort of like how, like if, if your whole, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like Oprah and Deepak Chopra or like I, like I once clicked on something and now every day Oprah and Deepak email me and tell me how to find inner peace on my ePod. <laughs> it's like, real, like this is this is my life now. Yeah. No, I know okay. it's so yeah, tough. it's weird. Um, this one is from Jenny from Connecticut. She's the only person who signed her question. I appreciate her openness about her identity. Uh, um, is it you? Oh, I love it. You did so good. Okay, what are you working on for your next bestseller? She's secreting it for you right there. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> Um, I've been doing, I've been having such a good time doing research for my next book, which I think might be a total yawn, because it's very serious. Um, and I think it'll be like 800 pages. <laughs> no, who knows, I don't know. But um, topics include Victorian California. Whoa. Chinese immigration during the Chinese Exclusion Act. Which is interesting for you to talk all as a Muslim American author. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Everybody, you just read between the lines here. Um, opium, mm-hmm. the opium trade, um, prostitute, like the history of prostitution in America. This and is not a yawn. This is very culturally relevant and intense. Well, yeah. I guess it is, but it's just interesting for me. But I think, I don't know, I don't know if the book is going to have like, it's not going to have a hot pink cover. I don't know, <laughs> that's all, I, I can foresee yeah. that already. Yeah, this it's was a, a cool little bit more. It's a little bit more um, somber. It's narrated by a ghost, so. Love. Love. <laughs> um, okay, this question. 
I'm amazed at how much variety there is in variety there is in your protagonists, genders, ages, social situations, locations, backgrounds, etc. Does this come easily to you as a writer, or is it something you had to really underlined work at? Hmm. I don't think I had to really work at it. I think I. I'm interest. I've always been interested in people who are sort of in the shadows and those are the weirder people on the fringe and those people i think by their very nature are eclectic sorts yeah so that's where i've been drawn to for my characters i really like this next question mm -hmm. it's a doozy and it's in beautiful script do you feel beautiful <sighs> I have moments where I feel not beautiful, and it's very upsetting. But I think that it's not... I, th I feel beautiful. That's really personal. Um, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I think that, that I... Ha I think when I'm at a hard point, like a, turn, like a sharp turn, and I don't know which way things are going. I can feel like my life is really ugly and then everything is ugly, yeah. but there's beauty in that too. Okay, that was a great answer. And I'm gonna use that to just throw in a question that I had that I like to ask people a lot. I just asked my father for the first time. Okay, presupposing that the two apartments are the same. There's two apartments one, and they're the same price and they look the same. One is in an ugly building looking out at a beautiful building, and one is in a beautiful building looking out at an ugly building. Which one would you rather live in? Sorry. Um, probably the ugly one. You'd like to live in the ugly one yeah. and look out at the beautiful one? Yeah. See, I want to be the beautiful one. You want to be the beautiful building. Yeah, I okay. want to live in the beautiful building and have people walk by and go like, I wish I lived in that building. I feel like, yeah, see, I feel like I would have more privacy in the ugly building. That is such good thinking. <laughs> You'd have zero gawkers. Right. You no, could do your thing in peace. No one would resent me for living in the ugly building. Wow. Okay, Re recalibrating over here. <laughs> okay. This is the last question. Thank you guys for writing such thoughtful questions. This is sort of in the vein of something I asked you, but I selected it because I thought it had some, some of its own merits. I noticed some reviewers had a really hard time with a female character who knows she's pretty. Why do you think this is so hard for people to accept? Why do people, wait, what? Can I see it? Yeah, of course. I noticed some reviewers, oh, had a hard time with a female character who knows that she's pretty. I didn't know that. Never. Why do you think Thanks this is for letting us know, guys. <laughs> Why do you think this is so hard to accept? Oh, because um because we're we're like in this stage or like er no one's allowed to think well of themselves in any kind of superficial way because that reflects poorly on the superficiality of others. I mean, the looks of others. Like if I'm like you can't say anyone is beautiful that person is really handsome because that's going to hurt the other guy's feelings. That's what I think is happening on social media. You're like, you can't say anything without it being like, well, what about that? What about that other thing that you didn't say? And I think that it extends to mm, people's self, I don't know, people's vanity. Yeah. I mean, why does it, why, who cares? What? I don't get it. By the way, I think who cares is an underrated answer. <laughs> like, I think people don't think you're loud, but like, who cares is a great answer. Like, just let it, as long as you don't tell people to shut up, I feel you like can say what, anything. Sorry. So, I, I so feel sorry. like what that question is trying to ask is like, the, like a question about like, I don't, I don't know if I really want to get into it, but like there's, there's um, you don't have to. You don't have to. 
the, the, I feel like what that question is asking is, okay, like, why do people have a problem with a woman who knows that she's beautiful? Because it's underlining something uncomfortable in culture, which we're coming up against in a violent way. And it's like, we don't want to admit that we have been putting value on beauty to such an extent that we've all gone completely nuts. So it's like, if I'm like, oh yeah, I am that thing, then you're like, oh wait, but we're not doing that anymore. We're not valuing beauty anymore. We're, we're doing this other thing. We're like, we're now we're like celebrating everybody. Everybody's beautiful, everybody, everybody. So now it's like not cool. Yeah, cause you're like, cause you're like, this wouldn't be a good attitude for a Dove ad. Right. No. Yes. Okay, I have one more question for you. This one comes from me. Okay. I love this cover. I couldn't stop looking at it. And I wondered if you could talk about this painting because I think it's like an incredibly um, interesting and unexpected take sure. on what the book is about. Oh, that's it. Oh, you think it's a take on the book? Yes. I, I yeah, because so this too. woman looks deeply placid and yeah. like she's, um, she could literally be asleep with her eyes open right here. We don't know. So the character in my book has been, she went to Columbia and studied art history, which I'm sure, whatever. She, so she, <clears throat> she, talks at, she's, she talks about art in the book, and one of the artists that she mentions is Jacques-Louis David, who painted this painting, which horrified me as a child when I saw it, and it's called The Death of Marat. And it's about this like dying French revolutionary bleeding to death in a bathtub. I mean, it's absolutely horrifying oh, God. And, and so awesome. So I was thinking about that painter. And then I, I started looking at other portraits that he'd painted. And I found this one. And it seemed really appropriate because this woman's expression is so contemporary in her like ennui. And I could feel her, there's a sense of time passing in this painting for me. Like I could feel her sitting there with the painter for days, but like her rich father had paid this guy how much money and she's just like, you know? <laughs> and I just, thought that, I just thought it was funny. And, and at the same time, she does look sort of peaceful, you know? Yeah, she does. Yeah, you're right, she does kind of look like she could be asleep. And she's got, I know this is not the right time in history to say this, great boobs. <laughs> well, you know what, they, they edit, they, they photoshopped out her nipples for the US edition of this book. Oh, because they're revealed in the real painting, there's like yeah. a gauzy kind of. Yeah, yeah, you could see them, you could see the nipples. And the reason they took them out, and I'm really okay with it, I really don't yeah. care, but um, the reason they took them out is that Amazon won't promote a book if it has nipples on the cover. <laughs> I bet, not to make this about misogyny, that they would promote a book with male nipples on the cover. I don't know. We should, is there anyone from Amazon here? <laughs> is there anyone with male nipples here who could speak to this? Um, everybody, I think we can really say that it's been a true honor and pleasure to uh, keep the company of Otessa Moshvig this evening. Thank you, Lena. It's been an honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Buy the book, tell your friends about the book. Support independent booksellers. This is a really important institution and it's a real pleasure for us to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you.